Moving forward against Jap countermeasures means knowing all the tricks the enemy has up his sleeve. Every once in a while, concealed Jap tanks pin us down. So one of the jobs of ordnance behind the line of fire is the immediate study of captured enemy weapons. On the Burma frontier, the first captured Jap tank to be put into working order is rushed back to Imphal, India. There, ordnance studies it to tell the boys at the front how to knock it out. This tank holds three men, Japanese size, and mounts a 37 caliber plus two 30 caliber machine guns. It has several good points. It's highly maneuverable for a quick right or left turn. And it can get along very well over ditches, trenches, and rough terrain. Notice how low the wheels go down in the ditch. If you don't want to crease in your helmet, dig your foxhole good and deep. But she's got weak points and can be made defenseless. It's vulnerable at all times. From a distance, it can be put out of commission with a rifle. Here's how. This is the rear idler and track. The wheel is held by only a single bracket. And a well-placed bullet can throw the track off the bogies by breaking this bracket. Thus stopping the tank dead in its tracks. Make a note of these weak spots the pistol ports and slits, the eyes of the tank when under fire. A splatter of machine gun fire can put out the eyes. Inside these ventilator hatches is the heart of the tank, the engine. Machine gun fire will knock it out. The ventilators are also vulnerable to close quarter attack with hand grenades and incendiaries. Under this hatch is the oiling system, fuel supply and batteries extremely vulnerable at close quarters. This is the best spot to set the tank afire, an ideal target for a Molotov cocktail. The turret is hand-operated, but there's a gap between the turret and the hull, and if anything is wedged between the two parts, the turret is useless. A canteen, a rock, or your bayonet will do the trick. Ordnance tried this tank out to compare its speed with our own. The course was four-tenths of a mile. The American tank, the one furthest from the camera, quickly forges ahead and rapidly increases the lead. The finish line. Time for our tank, 50 seconds. Jap tank, 55 seconds. Our tank, 10% faster. A pretty good tank, but not so tough against the soldiers who have taken time to learn the weapons of the enemy. B-29, the baby that's just beginning to plaster Japan and promises to continue until Hirohito says, Uncle. Uncle Sam, excuse please. It's so huge you can stand on that tail and look into any third floor window. The brains and heart of the plane are in here, and that's sick. 16 and a half foot Hamilton propellers. Four of them. The biggest in the business. Four 2200 horsepower motors. Listen to them sing. They're singing a swan song for the Nips, brother. The hottest tune on the hit parade. These boys had wire for cable. What they needed was a cable binder, and the binder was what they were just fresh out of. It was sure one of those times when you can't go by the numbers. So they said to hell with the numbers and made one anyhow. Out of what? Tubing from a discarded RL-31 reel, the kind you pay out wire with. They bent the ring gear to engage the pinion gear, all of which drives the pipe, thus making the two reels rotate around the group of wires. How'd they get gears a million miles from nowhere? They cut them to diameter with cold chisel and hacksaw and from the ends of beaten up reels. 
You hear teeth? They cut those too, with file and saw. See this gadget? It's known as a payout reel. This first reel being put on is a DR-8. It's filled with field wire W110B and is fitted on as snugly as possible. That's so when the DR-8 turns, it'll make the ring gear turn, thus turning the pinion gear. This second dr is just for counterbalance. It hasn't anything to do with lashing the field wires or laying the cable. When they got this far, all they had to do was bind the cable wires to the strands of field wire. Then as the spinner was pulled forward, the reel containing the lashing wire rotated around the strands of field wire, binding them firmly together. And what's more, with this homemade gadget, these guys wrap more wire in one day than they could have done in four without it. The murderous firepower of the bazooka is already a legend. But in Nettunia, Italy, thinking men increase firepower by using four bazookas mounted and tied to a German shell case. Then they rigged the complete affair to a machine gun mount set on a jeep. The result is a small-sized artillery attack, bazooka quadruplets, four-way murder with a purpose. One of the most difficult problems for our advancing armies is that of enemy mines. However, our metallic mine detectors have been developed to a point where we have this problem under control. In certain cases, we no longer explode metallic mines. By various ingenious devices, such as this soldier's forked stick, which enables him to spring the mine without exploding it, we're capturing them intact, to be saved and replanted against our enemy himself. But each time one side contrives something new or licks some problem posed by his opponent, the other side comes right back with another new gadget. The Nazis have answered our perfected technique of metallic mine detection with this simple little wooden box. Looks harmless enough, doesn't it? But it's just as deadly as the larger metal mine. A detonator is placed through a hole in the front and the firing pin set. The lid is then partially closed but prevented from closing entirely by a small twig placed under the edge. When this twig is disturbed, the lid falls, knocking out the pin. This is sure one little package that should be clearly marked. Handle with care. What are you doing to me? I'm on two, three, four. They marched up the beaches of Guadalcanal and Bougainville, marched into North Africa. They marched right into Sicily, marched... Hey, uh, wait a minute, hold it. Why, you're giving out with the idea that all we do in the infantry is march. But uh, somewhere between... Uh, hip, ching, hip, ho. Well, somewhere we've become more than marching. We're modern-day specialists. Well, you certainly helped the Nazis hightail it out of Sicily and Rome, too. But it was our Air Force that climbed up a couple of miles of clouds and cut loose with the first load of arguments to convince them that fascism doesn't pay. Well, the artillery helped. Don't forget our armored troops. They rolled right into the thick of it and did some tall convincing of their own. But uh, everybody knows it's the infantry that has to say the last word in this argument. We go in and tell it personally. There's nothing in front of us but the enemy. You might say, we're the men in no man's land. Good name for the infantry. The men in no man's land. It sure takes guts to walk in there shooting. But uh, we don't just walk in and start shooting. Now, there's no man's land, San Pietro, Italy. The Nazis were there a long time ahead of us. Plenty long enough to dig in solid. The first move we make, they cut loose. 
We hug the ground and start talking. With BARs and machine guns. And don't forget the 81 millimeter mortars. Their crews are really special. You know, you don't just aim an 81 at the enemy. Its fire's got to be plotted, and plotted right. Does the training you got back home help you much? You mean, like, keep your tail down, make yourself part of the terrain, not a bump on it? Well, brother, it's thanks to keeping low and taking advantage of every inch of cover that we are able to wipe out the forward Nazi guard positions and move in close. that town head-on must have meant a lot of casualties. That's why we didn't attack head-on. We went at them from the side. You mean you outflanked them? And what a flank. We had to climb straight up a mountain. And that's another place where training comes in handy. You know that when you're silhouetted against that skyline right on top of a mountain, you're a clay pigeon. You know that you've got to take advantage of the ground wherever you are. And if you get nicked, it doesn't make much difference whether it was a bullet or a rock splinter that kicked up like shrapnel. This is where you went on that patrol, isn't it? Yeah. From the military crest of that hill, the part just below the top, and the highest point that's safe on any mountain, an officer points out to us the route towards the enemy line. We've got to get some vital information or we can't move in. Men on these patrols must be experts in map reading, right? Well, they've sure got to know how to get where they want to get, and back. And they got to know what they saw and where they saw it. Don't forget, their reports have got to be written with absolute accuracy or they're not worth much. Right again. And we're always on the lookout for camouflaged gun emplacements and machine gun nests. Patrol reports the enemy's flank is weaker than the center. We move up. And taking advantage of the woods, close in. Four out of five dig in to cover our advance. In that way, we move forward protected by constant fire. And we really give it to those rats. With rifles, BARs, and mortars. Planting a phosphorus grenade does the most good. Knocking the buzzards right out of their nests. Grenades slung on every loop. Bayonets fixed and ready means infighting. And when the Nazis move out, their communiques will say they evacuated the positions. Oh boy, what a laugh. They'll mean the infantry blasted them out. And then we move in and mop up. Now we capture a house and know how to use them. And we take particular care that muzzle blast don't give away the position. And if we get a gun stoppage, one thing we can't do is call on ordnance. When the belt feed lever goes bad, we call on ourselves. We've been trained to know every piece of equipment we handle. And now this piece of land, this shattered town, is ours because the infantry moved in and took it. The infantry has made it another milestone along the great highway that leads to the end of this war. A highway along which they'll fight every yard of the way. They'll move on to newer battlefields. And wherever they stand, that land is free again. Free of the Nazis' shame and terror. They're the infantry. The guys who go in and tell it to the Nazis personally. The men in no man's land. The modern-day specialists who are going to trudge and crawl across Europe carrying victory and liberation in their knapsacks.